Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the mechanism of action of methotrexate. Okay, so we're now trying to understand why giving leucovorin or folinic acid or citrovorin factor or even n 5 formal tetrahydrofolate, these four names that are all for the same molecule, this molecule here, why giving that molecule can protect peripheral normal cells uh, from the toxicity of methotrexate. Okay, so N5 formal tetrahydrofolate can be converted to uh, N5 N10 mephenyl tetrahydrofolate. Okay, right. So, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to um, cleave one. Well, we're going to cleave these bonds here, basically. Okay. So, let me show you how we're going to do this. So it's this portion here that's all going to be affected. The rest of this structure is going to remain the same. And I'll talk you through what's going to happen before we actually discuss, well, before we actually draw out the structure. So this isn't a actual molecular mechanism. This is just to help us keep track of where everything's going. So imagine cleaving one of these two double bonds between the carbon and the oxygen here, OK? and uh, creating a, um, and breaking it in an even way, so giving one of the electrons back to the oxygen and giving one of the electrons back to this carbon, okay? Then imagine breaking the other bond, okay, this other bond here, in an uneven way, where both of the electrons go to the oxygen. So that means this carbon is going to gain a positive charge, okay, so it's had one electron stolen off it. Then imagine cleaving this bond between the nitrogen and the hydrogen in an even way again. So you'll cleave this bond in an even way. So that means this nitrogen has a free electron. This hydrogen has a free electron. This oxygen has a free electron from this bond that was cleaved evenly. So it's going to bind that with the free electron with the hydrogen. And then what you'll get is an oxygen atom which has a negative charge and a single bond to a hydrogen. Okay, so understand what I've said here. It has broken one of these bonds in an even fashion to create an unpaired electron, which it will bind with the unpaired electron of this hydrogen, which has come off the nitrogen because this bond's split in an even way as well. So you create an alcohol group here. Okay, then it cleaves this other bond unevenly and takes both electrons and it becomes a hydroxide anion. Okay, so you produce a hydroxide anion. Now, let's, re let's talk about the mess that you then get uh, left over with. So, this carbon has had an electron stolen off it. It also has a free electron from this one bond that was split evenly. It's going to use this one electron here to bind with the free electron from this nitrogen, so it will form a single bond there. Now, it still needs to gain two electrons, basically, because one was stolen from it, and it also wanted a pair anyway. So it needs to um, nick one, and it also wants a covalent bond. So what it's going to do is it's going to nick an electron off this nitrogen here. So remember, this nitrogen will have a lone pair of electrons. And what's going to happen is this lone pair of electrons is going to form a single bond with this carbon, basically. Okay? And the nitrogen will provide both electrons into this bond. So effectively, what it will do is it will donate one of the electrons to the carbon, and then the carbon will use that electron that it's received from the nitrogen to bind with the other electron from the nitrogen. So overall, what you will now get is, if I draw out the full structure, so I'll start off down here, so let me move this up. Right, so here we have the pyrimidine ring here. Okay, like so, with the other nitrogen down here. And you'll have a double bond there, a double bond here, and then an amino group here. Then off this, you'll then have this um, pyrazine ring as it once was, but of course it's long since lost the alternating double and single bonds. And now it's going to have a double bond up to this carbon here. Okay. Oh, whoops, I was meant to be drawing skeletal structures, but never mind, I'll 
uh, draw a tiny little bit of a molecular structure here just to make everything, because this is quite complicated, so I'll try and make it as transparent as possible. So then we've got a single bond there, okay, and then the rest of this structure is then just the same, so I can finally draw this structure without having to squeeze it in. Okay, so here's the benzene ring. Okay, and then you've got the carbonyl group coming up here, the nitrogen down here, and then the rest of the glutamic acid up here. So here's the carboxylic acid group, and then here is the R group of the glutamic acid. Okay, right. So, um, what you have basically done, to talk you through this again, so you've cleaved this bond between the nitrogen and the hydrogen, and you've done that in a homolytic way, so one electron went to each one, okay? That meant this hydrogen had a free electron. It then bound it to this oxygen's free electron, because the oxygen broke one of these bonds, the pink one, it broke that one homolytically, and therefore got a free electron here. Okay, so the oxygen bound that to the hydrogen's free electron to create a bond here. The oxygen then took both of the electrons in this bond here, the green bond, for its own, and therefore got a negative charge. So basically, oxygen already had two lone pairs of electrons, even when it was in this formal group here. Now it's got three lone pairs of electrons. One of these electrons, it stole off that carbon here. So that gives the carbon a um, positive charge, basically. Okay, so it's lost uh, an electron. Now, it always had a hydrogen bound to it. I never showed this because we were drawing a skeletal structure, but it always had this hydrogen bound to it. So one of the carbon's electrons was in this bond to the hydrogen. It then gained a free electron from this uh, bond between the carbon and the oxygen, which was split homolytically. It paired that with this nitrogen. Then it had one electron involved in a bond already with the nitrogen, but then it had nothing else before that, okay? So it had um, a bond here with the nitrogen as well, so this was this bond. But then it had nothing else because its other electron, its final electron, had been nicked off it by the oxygen. So now what it's going to do is nick an electron off this nitrogen here, and then it will bind uh, it will use that electron that it's nicked off the nitrogen to form another covalent bond with this final electron that was in the lone pair of the nitrogen, and that gives the nitrogen a positive charge. Okay, so the nitrogen is the overall thing which gets the positive charge, basically. And this is what's known as N5N10 methenyl tetrahydrofolate. Okay, now this can be converted into N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate. Okay, this one here. So, if you give leucovorin, leucovorin can be converted into N5N10 methenyl tetrahydrofolate, and N5N10 methenyl tetrahydrofolate can be converted into N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate. All you need to do is uh, put in a hydrogen with two electrons. If you put in a hydrogen nucleus with two electrons, okay, then what that will do is one of these electrons will come back to this carbon and it can therefore give this electron it's nicked off the nitrogen back to it. The nitrogen will get a lone pair again and then uh, this carbon will then bind that free electron that it's got to the hydrogen atom that's left over, the proton and one electron, and then you'll end up with a methylene group off here, just like so. So you'll end up with the N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate. Okay, so, basically, if you give leucovorin, it will allow cells to produce N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate in a different mechanism that does not require the activity of dihydrofolate reductase. Okay, so this will allow you to synthesize uh, thymidine monophosphate again because the substrate for the thymidinate synthetase enzyme was um, N5N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate. Okay, now the reality is that the amount of leucovorin you will give will not completely restore thymidine monophosphate, um, thymidine monophosphate synthesis. Okay, so you'll give too little to actually restore it 
back to what it should be, but it will restore it to a tiny little level, and this tiny little level will be enough just to avoid toxicity of the drug for normal cells, but it will not be enough to allow the cancer cells to divide again. So basically, you, do, you give mefotrexate to completely stop uh, the function of the dihydrofolic reductase enzyme, and then what you do is you give a tiny bit of this leucovorin, which will go into all the cells of the body, including the cancer cells, and it will restore a tiny amount of thymidine monophosphate, which will be enough for the uh, cells which are perfectly uh, normal within the body to survive. Okay, but it won't be enough for the cancer cells, which have a huge requirement for thymidine monophosphate, because they are um, they are dividing. So let me explain this. So remember that we have two requirements for thymidine monophosphate: protein synthesis to create mRNA and DNA replication. Now, if you are a normal cell that is not replicating, do you need to replicate your DNA? Absolutely not. However, it would be nice if you could synthesize proteins. So basically, you give enough of this leucovorin drug to produce you enough thymidine monophosphate that you can produce pieces of mRNA, and therefore it will restore a little bit of protein synthesis within cells, which will stop it being toxic to cells. Okay, But you do not give enough that you will be able to actually replicate DNA, because if you're going to replicate DNA, you will use absolute absolutely millions of thymidine monophosphate molecules, whereas if you're just producing a piece of mRNA, you will use hardly anything, basically. Uh, so you don't give enough that you'll have high enough levels of thymidine monophosphate to replicate the DNA, but you do give enough that you'll be able to synthesize proteins. So that stops it being so toxic for non-dividing cells, basically, without allowing it to restore um, um, cell division within cancerous cells. So often you will see mefotrexate given in combination with leucovorin, and leucovorin is to try and reduce the side effects of the drug, i.e. to restore protein synthesis in the normal cells, but not to um, allow cell division. So it will slightly reverse the functions of mefotrexate, but you don't give it in high enough doses that it will allow um, DNA replication, and therefore cells still cannot divide. So that's, this combination is very powerful and will stop cancer cells dividing.